Okay. Yeah, my name is Frank Lieben, as Steve said. Thank you for the introduction, Steve, and the uh, back information about this webinar. Uh, here's just a little bit of information about myself. Um, the reason I got involved in infrared thermometry, our radio thermometry, was because um, several years ago we decided that the calibrators that we had for infrared thermometers were not good enough. Um, this is back about 2005, and I was told I was going to become the expert. So I subsequently started studying a lot. And part of my background in education is I have a, a degree in electrical engineering. He had to take this class called Modern Physics, and I said, ah, this stuff I'll never use again, uh, and I forget about it. But lo and behold, I get my job here, and I'm using it years later. Okay, so let's go ahead and start. I'll come out today is we're going to be talking about sources of uncertainty, cache and equipment, traceability schemes, how do we get traceability back to the SI, Head up a laboratory. Uh, some considerations you want to have when you're thinking of setting up your own laboratory. Or if you have a laboratory set up already, you might want to go and review these. Uh, some procedures where you actually do the calibration, uncertain analysis, and reporting results. Um, just for action, IR thermometry calibration can be accurate, but in quarter. In order to be accurate, a proper procedure must be followed. Um, such a procedure is found in ASTM standard E2847, standard practice for calibration and accuracy verification of wide band infrared thermometers. And much of the presentation that we're going to have today is based off of this standard. Sources of uncertainty need to consider. Um, and we have classified these as major and minor. Uh, major ones are the ones you especially need to be um, aware of when you're setting up your laboratory and uh, doing calibrations. And the number one, and it's listed first here, is emissivity as the calibration source. And then build a view of the infrared thermometer. Do I have enough um, a large target size to calibrate my infrared thermometer? And the temperature gradients of the radiation source, alignment of the infrared thermometer, uh, creation of the radiation source itself, aperture and reflected temperature. We also have some that don't have general effect, but we still need to consider them when we're looking at uncertainty. And these are source heat exchange, atmosphere absorption, and display resolution. We need for calibration. There's some equipment that's mandatory, and we'll talk about that. In the following slides, uh, some of the mandatory equipment includes a thermal radiation source, a transfer standard, an end thermometer, mounting device, and a distance measuring device. Non mandatory equipment. Thermal radiation source. Um, this source can is calibrated, so it has traceability to the SI, and it can be one of the following types of sources. It could be either a flat plate, like we see here in the picture on the end of this slide, here, or a cavity. And a cavity um, is a device where the black body is. It basically forms a, a um, a type shape that is indented into a heat source. The um, thermal radiation source is that it provides thermal radiation for the calibration. You have to remember that the infrared thermometer is um, measuring thermal radiation that's incident up on it. That's how it determines temperature. Uh, for the thermal radiation source, um, for any fluke IR thermometer model, um, 5 inches or 125 millimeters diameter is enough for the calibration. Um, and then for this, you know, we don't just use a spot size like we see here in this circle, is that there's a stray radiation that comes from the outside of this field of view of the infrared thermometer. And this scatter, it's, it's well known. People don't try to hide it. Um, when the field of view is uh, specified, 
percent of the radiation that this ionometer reads comes within the circle. The other percent comes from outside here, and this is scatter. So um, we need for Fukai thermometer moss five inches diameter or 125 millimeters is enough. If you use a smaller target, uh, you run the risk that some of the radiation is coming off from the outside here. We're going to uh, either be in an uncertainty if you know about it, or if you don't know about it, it's going to be an error in your calibration. Now, for other IR thermometer manufacturers, um, it gets a little bit tougher. You can actually consult the manufacturer or whoever's name is on the side of the IR thermometer. But likely, um, a lot of these instruments are come from OEMs. They're, they're manufactured by somebody else and labeled with the company's name. So the actually either, either may not tell you, but more likely they just don't know. Um, so the other way you can determine how big, how much you need for calibration is by doing testing. So transfer standard. Um, so this basically is how you get um, traceability for your thermal radiation source. Um, this transfer standard can take one of two forms. It can come through contact thermometry, so the transfer standard is a PRT, a thermocouple. It can non-contact thermometry. In this case, the transfer standard is a radiation thermometer. We talk a little bit more about this under traceability schemes. Um, now, implementation, you can either implement one of these transfer standards internally or the third party laboratory. Uh, the reason really bring this up here is because um, scheme two is going likely to give you better uncertainties for a calibration. Scheme two is not contact thermometry. Um, doing a lot of calibrations of these flat plates, um, it's probably not worthwhile going and buying your own radiation thermometer than training traceability for that radiation thermometer. And that's not the point about, yeah, you probably want to use a third-party laboratory um, like us here in American Fork, Utah. And temperature. Um, you have some way to monitor ambient temperature, um, besides it being a requirement in 17025. Uh, it also plays into a couple of uncertainties. Uh, these uncertainties include reflected ambient radiation and ambient temperature. Mount device. This is the IR thermometer. Uh, mount device can take um, one of the forms. It could be a tripod, uh, some fixed ring that your laboratory comes up with, with its own, or it can be the human hand. And if you have big enough um, thermal motion source or target that you're aiming at with the infrared thermometer, typically a um, mount calibration, basic calibration when you're using your hand as a mounting device is typically good enough. For some of the technicians in your laboratory are very nervous or they have trouble with trigger seats, uh, you might consider getting some better fixturing for them. The general mounting device is, number one, it maintains alignment to the, between the IR thermometer and the thermal radiation source, and it also maintains the measuring distance. So we'll talk about measuring distance in a few slides. Yeah, it's, it's right here. Um, so for your calibration, you need a distance measuring device just to verify measuring distance. Um, some IR thermometers are, tend to be a little bit more reliant on measuring distance than others. Um, there's a thing about if you have the IR thermometer too close to the target that um, you may have problems, and I'll talk about those a few slides. Uh, just far away, you start losing your field of view um, on your uh, thermal radiation source. Uh, these devices are dependent on this so-called calibration geometry. Anyway, measuring distance. Now, what is that? Um, we've used brought up this term. Well, as IEC defines it, it's the distance or distance range between the radiation and thermometer, so in our case, red thermometer, and the target measured object 
for which the radiation thermometer is designed. So right here we have the measuring distance between our flat plate right here and our thermometer right here. So, so some things you can use for your distance measuring devices. You can use a tape measure like we see here. And this is an effective way to use neat measure is before you start your measurement, um, you don't even have your eye thermometer close to the target yet. You could take your tape measure and off the distance right here by just looking down the front of the eye thermometer housing onto the tape measure, and you'll tape measure. And you don't have to look down again at that, that measurement. The measuring rod is one I first saw at uh, NIST when I visited their laboratory for radiation thermometry. Um, I think they have calibrated down to the micron. I don't think that's precision necessary for this measurement. Um, I think you can get away with a millimeter. It is would rate. But anyway, measuring rod, um, the idea here is that you have a, a some sort of a rod, uh, a piece of sheet metal, for instance, it's always at the same distance that you can use for that measurement. So that's a couple ideas. You may come up with others as well. It's on mandatory equipment that may be used on special calibrations. Some uh, equipment include, can be an aperture. There's a few models of IR thermometers that do require aperture for calibration. For flute models, I'm thinking of the Raytech MX series. Uh, I think it was an MX2, an MX4, an MX6 in that series. They required an aperture and a measuring distance. Uh, and flute but Raytech, that was, those models became the flute 572, uh, 74, and 576. I see a lot of those models out in the field in the United States. Um, however, I was uh, in an email conversation with one of our customers a few weeks ago, and he says, yeah, I do get those models in um, periodically for calibration. So I know they're out here in the U.S. Um, there's also this thing about frost and dew prevention. Um, you may need this if you're doing calibrations below um, the inner frost point in your laboratory. In some cases, um, especially if you're in an area um, down east U.S. where it gets very humid, um, your your ambient air in your laboratory may be have quite a humidity in it, and so that brings the frost or dew point really close to ambient. Um, I think in our laboratory here in Utah, where we're dry, it's probably um, probably about five degrees Celsius. What happens is when you get below the frost and dew point, you, on your thermal resource, on your target surface, you are forming water, either in the dew or ice. And that water, it can damage your target, number one. But the other um, thing you need to worry about there is that um, the humidity of that surface is going to change, which will cause an error in your measurement. So those things to consider for non-mandatory equipment. So traceability schemes. We're doing uh, traceable work here. And we have traceability back to the SI. To do that. Um, so for contact traceability, and again, a contact traceability is where we're getting our traceability for thermal radiation source with a contact thermometer. In this, our, we have a contact thermometer here. It's either a PRT, a thermometer, or a thermal couple. And it has traceability through my National Geological Institute uh, to the SI. This thermometer is used to um, get a reference temperature for thermal radiation source. And we use this scheme, we have to consider, number one, the delta T, a difference in temperature between the surface and the contact thermometer itself, and this is because of heat flow. 
and to estimate what that delta T is. Um, there are methods to estimate that, but they're rather complicated mathematically. You wanna, if you're really interested in that, those methods, you can shoot me an email, and I'll try to share with you a couple papers that are, again, they're mathematically complicated. But some metrologists like things that are mathematically complicated, and that's great. Um, but the other thing that we really have to consider, too, is emissivity. Um, now, emissivity of a flat surface can be very widely from, from painted surface to painted surface. And this is one that really can cause us a lot of error if we don't estimate it properly. And your uncertainties are likely to be large in this case. So we have these two things in consideration to calibrate our IR thermometer using a contact thermometry traceability scheme or scheme one. Scheme two is traceability through um, a radiation thermometer. In this, we have a transfer radiation thermometer that's calculated either by NMI or somebody who has traceability to an NMI. And in turn, that NMI, through key comparisons, they can claim traceability to the SSI. Uh, the transfer radiation thermometer that we're using to calculate or get traceability for a reference radiation source has a length. And I'm going to turn that lambda one here. Lambda one, or the wavelength for this radiation thermometer, be similar to the wavelength of the IR thermometers that are being calibrated on this reference radiation source. Um, in this right here, we don't we've account for the emissivity and the difference of temperature by uh, calibrating the surface with a radiation thermometer. However, we have to be careful here because the wave of this transfer standard and the length of the unit under test must be more. If not, uh, we lose stability. Now, just for an example, if your standard is 3.9 instrument, 3.9 micrometer instrument, and your iodometer is 8 to 14, then then you'd be doing this calibration. You don't have traceability. As an example of traceability schemes, I will talk about how we um, climb traceability through our flat plates, our, our infrared calibrators, the 4180 and 4181, here at our laboratory to American Fork. Our 4080 and 4181 Celebrated using a KT19. KT19 is a radiation thermometer. Uh, the ones we use are 8 to 14 instruments. And we do calibration of the here in American Fork and our infrared cavities in our infrared laboratory. So, right here, this path right here in red is scheme 2 traceability. Okay, so our cavities. Uh, cavity is actually monitored by TRT. We can do this as our cavities have very well defined emissivity. Uh, their cavities are inside a, a bath, a temp bath, and we've done quite a bit to um, get the um, temperature uniformity in our cavity walls to be uniform. And so in this case, we we can get better uncertainties using a PRT for this calibration of our uh, cavities. Our PRTs have traceability through our primary lab here in American Fork, uh, through fixed point cells which have traceability to NIST, which gives traceability to the SI. What we do do um, to verify our cavities is we do uh, do a verification using scheme 2 traceability with a traceable radiation thermometer that's calibrated at PTB. That's PTB is an NMI in Germany. Um, and we just cross -check, check using a normal equivalence type test. That we use a, a proficiency test or inter-laboratory comparison. 
So that cross check has traceability to the SI through PTD. Um, laboratory temperature limits. Just for all calibrations, uh, we have to worry about ambient temperature uncertainty, and that has to be accounted for. Um, we aren't just um, dependent on that as, uh, for instance, the um, world of metrology. Um, I know they have to observe these levels very, very, very strictly, but we still have to observe it. And the reason for this um, in an infrared thermometer is these instruments have te the technology of the sensor is similar to that of a thermal couple. And we have to measure the temperature that's generated from the radiation that's incident upon the sensor and come back to a reference temperature. So the temperature difference in the laboratory can have an influence on that reference temperature. The other thing we need to worry about is reflected temperature uncertainty or uncertainty due to reflected radiation and to a lot of calibrations actually at lower temperatures. So those uncertainties should be in your uncertainty analysis for your, your calibration, but also you have a way to control those so that you um, aren't underestimating those uncertainties. Set up your laboratory. Um, a few considerations you, you want to take into account. Um, you should not have a heat source facing a uh, flat plate. In this diagram here, right here, we have two heat sources basically facing each other. And that's a no because your reflected temperature, your reflected radiation is increased by having another heat source. But of course, it doesn't have to be another flat plate. A heat source could be another calibration instrument that's at a higher temperature. And it could all be anything like um, a printer that's uh, producing a lot of heat. So that's one thing you need to be careful with. A sample here is a heat plate, flat plate facing an exterior wall, a shit window. Um, what happens here is that you have a wall that's going to the outside of the uh, side of the building to the outside environment, which can be quite a bit different than your inside temperature of your building. That wall insulation, you may have double pane glass, but there is still going to be some sort of heat flow through that wall. Um, or we have heat flow, you're going to have temperature drops, so that can cause you to underestimate your, reflected, your effects of reflected radiation on that calibration. The thing here that we see here is um, you don't want to have a flat plate in the vicinity of air drafts. And this thing we have something that looks like an HVAC vent up above with maybe a return here on the side. It looks like a return, though, because the arrows are pointing the wrong way, but what the heck. Uh, <laughs> um, that can really influence the amount of heat that's coming off of this plate by convection and create an artificially lower temperature in that case. Another thing you need to keep in mind is you want to keep that flat plate away from commonly used traffic ways, such as a place where um, a pathway next to the calibration area where people are constantly going by. And this is actually a problem if you locate your instrument close to a door that's constantly being opened and closed. Again, the problem here is a um, artificial high convection called to these in the laboratory. Let's talk about a correct setup. We should have a well-reflected uh, temperature, well-conflected temperature, I should say. In this case, our flat plates are facing an interior wall. Looks like we have some insulation in this wall so that's kind of blocking it out from the next uh, room. Yeah, that's good practice. We have sufficient spacing from other instruments. Right here, I say we're minimum distance apart. You can put the two instruments closer, but the one thing you're going to want to keep in mind is you're going to want to do some sort of testing to verify that that is not influencing your measurements. Um, what happens is that these all these instruments have fans in them. Uh, again, fans create airflow, 
in the laboratory, and airflow can create artificial convection. So flow goes from this instrument to the front of this instrument. Um, right here is that we should ha be isolated from air drafts in, in the room. Reflected temperature. This is especially a concern for lower temperature calibrations. And so, is you going want to consider putting a partition between where the unit under test is being held and the um, thermal radiation source? What is that makes the reflected temperature for the thermal radiation source that of the partition and not of your body? Um, wants to be higher than a laboratory temperature. Um, I hope nobody has a laboratory that's up about 95 degrees um, Fahrenheit. Um, 35 of our friends that use Celsius. Uh, that would be rather hot and unpleasant to work in. Uh, plus, it may have other effects in your calibration. Um, this probably never be a concern if you're doing calibrations above 100 degrees Celsius. Calibrations below 50 or below, you're going to want to start considering well, do I need a partition or not? Um, is my body temperature affecting this calibration? Um, the way you can test it is you can create a, a real partition. Um, I would suggest using cardboard, um, which is rather cheap. You can partition, test to see if there's a difference using the partition versus not using the partition. Um, if you and you will consider using a partition cal uh, for that calibration, if you use a partition, don't continue using that cheap piece of cardboard. Get something that looks decent, um, and so it looks quite a bit better for, especially you get into in your laboratory. Um, I don't think hokey hokey piece of cardboard is going to look very good. So, um, yeah, you want to put the your best foot forward with the accessories. So for calibration procedure, there's a certain amount of prepper uh, you need for this calibration. Uh, you consider what calibration points you need to use for that calibration and then the, the procedure itself. So for preparation, you need to allow that IR thermometer time to reach room temperature. Um, you need to do a thermal soak. Uh, I would recommend a minimum a very bare bones minimum of at least 15 minutes. The reason this is it goes back to that these instruments are highly dependent on reference temperature. If I take an instrument from my loading dock, which may be at some temperature, say in the winter, uh, that loading dock may be 0 degrees C, 10 degrees C, and you not run to your laboratory and start doing measurements. Um, Thermometer's reference temperature is going to be so between your laboratory's temperature and what that loading dock temperature is, and so that instrument needs to soak at ambient. Um, the number two thing is lens cleaning. I don't recommend that any of you try lens cleaning on an instrument. Um, this can be very risky for your laboratory, and it may put you for some liability. Uh, being said, I gave my caution there. Um, I will say that if you need to clean a lens, only clean it if, if the request by the customer or if the customer knows about it. And when you do cl clean the lens, you need to clean it per the manufacturer's instructions. You have to keep in mind that these instruments are optical instruments. And it's like if I don't clean my glass properly, I'm labeled to damage my glasses, um, and I won't see it as well. Well, if you don't clean the lens properly, you're liable to damage the uh, ops of that instrument, and the instrument won't measure as well. After that, uh, you need to also consider setting up any special equipment you have, such as a dry air purge, an aperture, et cetera. Your radiation source to the desired temperature, and allow uh, thermal radiation source time to stabilize at that temperature. As far as calibration points go, 
question is what calibration point should you use for a calibration? Quietly, this should be uh, driven by the customer. The customer should be telling the laboratory what calibration points they they want uh, because they have a specific use for that IR thermometer. They should know where the instrument needs to be calibrated. Now, that being said, um, quite often customers won't know that they'll want the laboratory, you, the metrologist in the laboratory, to offer advice. So you need to consider what usage range that customer has. If that has a wide usage range, say from 100 to 500 degrees Celsius, you need to consider a, at least three points for that calibration. Something that's close to 100, something close to 500 degrees Celsius, and something in between, such as 300 degrees Celsius. Um, but you may consider more points as well. Um, and a, a wide range, you may want to consider more points, or if you're doing a lot of work around um, straddling ambient, in that case, you may want to do more points as well. Uh, over narrow usage range, one or two points may be fine. Um, I consider the local uh, warehouse that we have close by with a food court and have a Fluke 62 hanging up in, um, in the food court that they measure the pizzas with as they come out of the pizza oven. Um, that may be a, a situation where they have a very narrow usage range. Uh, so one and two, one or two points may be fine for them. But I'm not writing their procedures, so they need to make that determination themselves. Um, anyway, uh, that being said, when you're considering the calibration points, what order you use in your calibration, you want to perform the calibrations from the low point to the highest. The reason for this is if you do the highest point first, um, you're going to heat up the body of your, your infrared thermometer. And then you go down to measure a low point. Um, that risk temperature is going to be distorted and cause error in that measurement. For each calibration point, is you set the IR thermometer, reflect temperature. Um, measures they call this background temperature, if available. And typically, it's not going to be available because the calculation is uh, made inside the infrared thermometer. In fact, floor handled instruments. Um, I don't really use this as being a factor. Again, if you're doing a thermal imager, this is called background temperature. There are also some higher um, end infrared thermometers where the setting you need to worry about. But for handheld instruments, typically, I don't have any that you need to set the reflected temperature. Um, you need to set your emissivity of your thermometer. So it is the same as the emissivity of the source. There are some IR thermometers that have a fixed emissivity. Typically, it will be 0 0.95. In those cases, you may need to make a mathematical compensation for that difference in emissivity settings. Mathematical compensations are doable, but the math is a little bit messy, so be careful there. In the 4180 and 4181, uh, that emissivity is adjustable. And again, we aren't changing, not changing the emissivity of the surface of those instruments. We're actually doing that same sort of mathematical composition internal to the instrument's um, controller. Find the eye thermometer. You'll need to set the distance. I'm calling this a Z direction if we're thinking about Cartesian coordinates, X, Y, and Z coordinates. So you set a distance off. This is your measuring distance that you're going to use for your calibration. Then you find the IR thermometer from side to side and up and down. I call this X and Y directions. A little tight on this um, in one of the following slides. Um, when you get process, this part of the process done, that IR thermometer should be no more than five degrees from north of the tar target. So it's R degrees. And perpendicular. And this is something that's pretty easy for a laboratory, um, a technical laboratory to maintain. 
point you're ready to make the measurement, you should make the measurement 10 times the IR thermometer response time. Um, this is an example. And I use this time in this example because those of these IR thermometers do have a response time of 0.5 seconds. IR thermometer response time of 0.5 seconds. Make the measurement for seconds. In other words, 10 times that response time. Should take less than 15 seconds to do per cal point. Distance, again, we talked about using a tape measure. One of the features about the 4180 and 4181 is that this surface right here and this little corner on the controller um, are within about a millimeter of each other. And so my recommendation to everybody is to use this corner right here to set off your measuring distance. Uh, number one, it's collinear. It's in the same uh, plane here, up and down. The other thing is that you do not want to touch the surface of this target. The surface is painted. Uh, that paint has an evasivity that's been determined by calibration. You do not want to do anything to damage that paint. And this keep having to do any wacky math by, okay, I have uh, up here and I have a point on the outside. What's the difference of those measurements? I have to subtract. Now, do you just use this point right here at this corner? Um, typically, our sources of our targets are large enough that you can just use a laser for the alignment. Um, one caution about these lasers is in many of these instruments, the laser, the laser comes out of is located just above the optics of the infrared thermometer. It's something called parallax. Lasers, uh, if you put the laser at the center of the target, the actual center of the focus of the infrared thermometer is going to be just below that laser. Um, but typically, that is not going to hurt you um, because the target surface is big enough on these 4180s and 4181s. The unique is something called maximizing alignment. This is where we take the infrared thermometer, you move it back and forth and up and down uh, to the, the optical center of that target. Uh, this serves three purposes. Um, number one, does the optical alignment, yes, we get the optical center of the infrared thermometer in the center of that target. But number two, well, the other thing that that does is that it um, just it gives us confidence that our target is big enough. And the way that is when you move this instrument back and forth, uh, look at the readout of this infrared thermometer right here. Um, you should see a, a case where you're forming a Area you have sharp change at the edges here, but in the as you traverse across um, a large area target, you should see basically a shape that looks like a plateau if you were to graph it. That means that your target surface is large enough. If you think as you're scanning across, it looks more like a mountain peak. Okay, you quickly reach a temp max temperature, then it quickly shoots back down. You either have some serious um, alignment problems or your surface of your target is not large enough. And so this, I will not get deep into this uncertainty analysis um, just because uh, for time purposes, I could probably spend another hour talking on the subject and how to uh, calculate these uncertainties. This uncertainty analysis uh, includes uncertainties that are listed in uh, STM standard. Um, and ASTM, the uncertainty listed in the ASTM standard are based on literature from BIPM that they got for radiation thermometry uncertainties. Um, this uncertainty analysis that I list here is for a specific model, a specific source, or a specific laboratory. So don't use this in your own laboratory for 100 degrees C. Go out and compute your own uncertainties um, for your own calibration setup. However, being said, um, this uncertainty down here is probably pretty typical for this type of a, a setup, uh, calibrating an infrared thermometer with a 4080 or 
181. We report your results. Your report of calibration should contain the following information. Title, identification of the calibrated infrared thermometer, such as model number and serial number, a record person who performed the calibration, the date of the calibration, temperature is the infrared um, thermometer read temperature, during distance, emissive setting of the infrared thermometer, Diameter source. Again, you're specifying your calibration geometry. This customer knows how you calibrated it. Um, the ambient temperature of the laboratory. Description uh, of the aperture, if you use an aperture in the calibration, and where it was in the calibration geometry, and, you met, and the measurement uncertainties for that calibration point. That may you want to consider as well are descriptions of the calibration procedure, reference instruments, a traceability statement, and a description of the uncertainty budget. Summary: um, I've laid out a good procedure here and some good information to follow uh, when you're doing calibrations in your own laboratory. Um, follow a proper procedure, you get better calibrations. And when you get better calibrations, you have end up with happy customers that I want to come back to your laboratory for um, calibrations, but they will all tend to recommend your laboratory to other potential customers, which is good for your own business. And then we'll turn the time over for questions. Okay. Thank you for that presentation. Cheers while I'm talking. Yeah, there we go. So we don't give you. We're ready to take questions. I've received a couple here. So if you have any additional questions, please text those in now to the host of the chat window. And we'll start answering questions now. The first one, Frank, is there's a couple parts to it. Part is, uh, he would like to know what kinds of calibrations can be made using aperture. Okay. Uh, and so the IR thermometer model. Um, yeah, I think the name is sounds like Gregory. <laughs> I think it, I think it's like Gregory in English. So Gregory, um, the type of thermometer calibrations that can be made um, in future, um, typically that's going to need to come from that information is going to need to come from the manufacturer. For handheld hand wire thermometers, typically you won't will not need an aperture. Um, you're doing some of the higher end work on. Um, high-end radiation thermometers, you may need to consider an aperture. Uh, and again, those models for uh, fluke instruments are that need to do an aperture are the fluke uh, 572, fluke 574, and fluke 576, which to be the old rate tech models, MX2, MX4, and MX6. Okay. I It looks like we have an email address. I'll send you the papers on uh, the papers you requested. Okay. What's our next question was, let me find that. How do you determine what the measure distance will be for a calibration? Okay, measure no distance uh, for calibration. Um, so really, the manufacturer should be supplying you with that information. Uh, now, that being said, you typically won't get information from a manufacturer. Um, I will tell you that for most of the Fluke models, and I'm thinking of a Fluke 568, uh, 5C1, uh, 5C6, uh, Fluke 62 Max, 50, and 62 Max Plus, measuring distance that uh, recommend for those instruments is um, 20 centers, which if you use inches, that's 11 inches. Um, for instruments, you may have to do some testing, and I, I think we have a white paper out on our website still that talks about what types of tests you can do to determine if you have enough field of view. The key thing is that you have enough field of view for that calibration, but you should not be too close to the um, flat plate as well. 
I recommend not going any closer than 10 centimeters or four inches to that flat plate. Otherwise, you'd run into some problems. Okay. Next question, Frank, is um, he would like more about knowing the uncertainty budget. Could you talk a little bit about that? I would recommend doing a test, a repeatability test, using that infrared thermometer um, on a on surface that's stable. Do a repeatability test basically over um, at least five different measurements that are um, probably at least uh, one from each other, just to see what the repeatability of that um, that particular IR thermometer is. You'd probably, if you're doing a whole bunch of the same model or thermometer, um, if you get data, you could probably apply that to the whole uh, model family. Next question is, what would be the ideal material to make a partition out of, and are there materials that you would stay away from? Question, and I probably should have brought this up. Um, so, um, that's the next question. I'm, I apologize for not even bringing that up. Um, I would stay away from using things that's metal. I would all try to go as thin as possible with that being transparent. I'd probably stick to something that has higher emissivity so you aren't getting reflections from the target off the surface back to the target. Um, so stay away from sheet metal. Be as possible, um, and um, yeah, try to highly emiss emissive. Um, I said cardboard, not to leave a cardboard box up there, but cardboard, something like card sock, it almost yeah, card a little bit too thin because it's going to be too flimsy. But that is um, um, like an ideal thing if you can make it look neat for an assessor. The only thing. With something that's as thin as cardstock, I'd be a little bit scared um, that it would be get damaged, or you know, you could hurt the size of that opening of that hole. That might be a problem, um, but it doesn't look very good after probably too many uses. Um, so you want to consider going something a little bit thicker, like poster board. The next question is: You mentioned. In the presentation about uh, contact thermometer, use, but um, how that so it doesn't damage the black body surface? That's a question. That's a question too. Um, so BK, um, so the contact thermometer. I don't. I don't recommend using a surface probe as a contact thermometer. Um, just it will damage the surface. Um, typically, what is done is the contact thermometer is embedded into the uh, surface in either the flat plate or if it's a cavity, a black body cavity, um, behind the uh, cavity bottom, if you will, uh, or where the thermometer is measuring. So there's always that little bit of distance. It could be um, five millimeters, it could be one centimeter, but there's always some distance there between that contact thermometer and that surface. Um, but so we talk about having a delta T because there is that separation between that contact thermometer and that and that surface. Um, but in any case, uh, I would really recommend that if you're using a flat plate, and even a lot of the industrial type cavities, you're much better off using a radiation thermometer to get your traceability as opposed to a contact thermometer. It just gives you lower uncertainties because of the emissivity. Okay, those are all the questions I have. Why don't we check your panel here, Frank, if you've got any additional ones. Okay, that one. Well, I haven't answered here uh, on this note. It says, do you notice measurement accuracy issues when positioned at the distance? Uh, so I was recommended for calculation. Um, do you have any suggestions of how to lessen variation? Um, 
you'll see in your own laboratory if you do the alignment technique I, I mentioned where you go back and forth and up and down at that distance. Um, you should have a variance over several degrees uh, traversing across the surface of that tar target. Um, but again, is to do the diameter of that target, then you probably are going to have issues. Um, so they have 11 inches or 28 millimeters for our flute, most of our fluke instruments, that is using a, a diameter of a target that's at least five inches. Um, the second part of this question is, do you have any suggestions of how to lessen this type of variation? Um, Again, I would suggest a some sort of repeatability test in your laboratory to determine this. Um, a bipod does help, or mount devices do help. However, that will mean additional time in your calibrations. And so you probably need to do your own study with your own people um, to determine this. Um, you know, one thing to consider too is one technician may not have the same trigger technique as another technician. Something that I've seen people have trouble with is when they release that uh, imometer trigger, uh, they'll sometimes jerk that instrument and bolts reading on the readout. Do you have any more, Steve? Why don't you chat window there, Frank? There may be another one in there. Um, keep going down. I think we mentioned this one. Yeah, we talked about. Okay, let's. I've got another one here. Frank it says um, we're looking at the 9132, 9133 for calibrating handheld thermometers. What distance should be used with the these held devices? So with 32 and 33, um, typically 11 inches isn't going to be in, isn't enough. Um, it's going to be too far away just because of the size of this. Especially with higher thermometers with uh, DDS ratios of 10 to 1 or 12 to 1. Um, when you're looking at 50 to 1 um, DDS ratio, it probably is enough. Now, I'd recommend that there is a white paper that I have on the site and um, email me. I can get you to do the URL for that white paper because I can't remember exactly where it is on our site at this point. 